All right. Uh, I hope you guys are all uh, doing well. Happy Monday, everyone, and uh, and we will continue on in our uh, yes, our lectures. And uh, and so today I'm going to start us off with some uh, Bayesian basics. Okay, just some some basics of Bayesian statistics, and just kind of uh, introduce um, some Bayesian concepts along with the um, beta distribution. Uh, this is, there's no Monte Carlo stuff yet. Um, and in the beginning, when we do Bayesian statistics and introduce Bayesian ideas, um, we'll, we'll take kind of a, I guess, a traditional approach um, without using any Monte Carlo stuff. And then later on, uh, we'll see kind of the need for doing, uh, for answering questions uh, using Monte Carlo methods here. All right. So um, I'm going to kind of present uh, Bayesian concepts as, uh, as a contrast to frequentist uh, concepts and frequentist uh, statistics ideas here, OK? And so pretty much, I, I imagine all of your statistics and probability background is comes kind of from a frequentist perspective. And so if you've taken either AP statistics, or if you took stats 10 at UCLA or equivalent, uh, those are almost always taught with a, from a frequentist uh, statistics uh, perspective. And, and that's fine. Um, you know, so, sometimes you hear about kind of like the battle between uh, Bayesians and frequentists. And I, you know, I'm not, um, I don't really take sides, okay? Uh, it's, um, you know, I think both have their applications and, and uses. Okay, so, you know, in frequentist statistics, uh, you might have some kind of coin, and we'll talk about the probability that the coin lands heads is 0.5. And when we talk about a probability in frequentist statistics, the probability is defined as the long run relative frequency of an event, okay? Meaning that if I flip this coin, uh, many, many, many times, something that approaches infinity, then the proportion of times that the coin is going to land head, the relative proportion is going to be something around 0.5, okay? And, um, and when we do frequentist statistics, kind of a, a lot of uh, the methods that we do, such as maximum likelihood estimation, uh, creating confidence intervals, those are both kind of frequentist ideas, okay? These are uh, ideas from uh, frequentist statistics. So, um, you know, a lot of times it's useful to think of a model, some kind of generative model, a model that generates the data that we are observing, okay? And in frequentist statistics, the models, uh, these models are defined by parameters with fixed values, okay? So, um, so for example, I've got this, I have this box and, uh, sorry, it's so noisy. The box has a bunch of marbles in it, okay? And some marbles, if I, if I reach in here, some of the marbles are blue, okay? Whereas if I uh, reach in and grab some other, some other marbles are not blue, all right? And so we can ask a question. Um, we can say that uh, this box is, uh, generates data, Okay, either being blue or not blue. Okay, and the way it generates data is that there is a proportion of blue marbles in this box, and basically uh, the marbles that it produces are coming from a Bernoulli distribution. Okay, and if we're only just if we're going to draw like say ten marbles or something out of it, and we're just going to count how many blue marbles we get, then we would say. Um, this is generating marbles from a binomial distribution, right? So, so we've got some kind of, we have a, a probabilistic model that, that we can use to explain the data that this, that this um, box is generating, okay? And so uh, the box, the model is, going, is defined by, um, is defined by these parameters, right? And so in the case of a binomial distribution, the parameters that define the box are things like, er, er, is basically the proportion that's blue, the proportion that's blue. Uh, and if it's binomial, it's gonna be also include uh, how many marbles you're drawing out, 
from the box, okay? You might have other models, such as you might have a model that uh, if the data you're recording is how tall someone is, okay, you pick a random person and you're gonna measure how tall that person is, the, um, the data, the, the model that generates the data that you observe there can be like a normal distribution, a normal distribution with some mean and some standard deviation or some variance. Um, and when we, um, from a frequentist perspective, those parameters are treated as fixed values, okay? They are unknown to us and we want to estimate them, but they're treated as fixed, okay? And so, so you know, let's say I drew, I drew 10 marbles out of this box with a replacement. Six of them are blue and the rest, the other four are not, okay? And so based on that, what is going to be the maximum likelihood estimate for the proportion of marbles that are blue in the box? we are going to, um, to do this, we can do maximum likelihood estimation, right? So we can find the a maximum likelihood estimate for theta. And, uh, and we start off by finding the likelihood function of the data that we've observed, okay? So we're gonna find that, uh, so, so we create the likelihood function and we wanna find the value of theta that's going to maximize this likelihood function. So we want you know, our estimated theta to be kind of the, the value of theta that maximizes L. And in our case, if we say this is coming from a binomial distribution where we've drawn 10 observations and six are blue, um, it's gonna be the value of theta that maximizes 10 to six theta raised to the six, one minus theta raised to the four, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, take the derivative of this thing uh, with respect to theta, and we're gonna set it equal to zero and we're gonna solve for theta. All right, so, uh, you know, finding the derivative of some kind of large product, that can get really messy, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we often take the log of the likelihood function. So you're often dealing with the log likelihood and that turns all of the products into sums and, uh, and that, that kind of makes our life a little bit easier. And so um, uh, 10 to six is equal to uh, 210. So we're gonna do log 210 plus six log theta plus four log one minus theta, right? So because if you do log, uh, the log of theta raised to the six is gonna be six log theta. Log of this is, you know, four times log of one minus theta, okay? Then I take the derivative of this log likelihood with respect to theta. I get um, all of this. So this is a constant, so that becomes zero. Six log theta becomes six over theta. Four log one minus theta becomes four divided by one minus theta multiplied by negative one because of the chain rule. And then we're gonna set this equal to zero and then we solve for theta. So we set that equal to zero. I move uh, the negative four over one minus theta to the other side, multiply by multiply through. And when we go through all of that process, um, our estimate of theta, so this should, I guess, be theta hat, our estimate of theta that's gonna maximize the likelihood is gonna be 0 0.6. Okay, and so this is just maximum likelihood estimation. This should be reviewed. I, you guys probably did this, I think, in 100B, right? Where um, you know you're trying to find the value of some uh, some parameter that maximizes the likelihood. Okay, so if this is the data that we've observed, 10 marbles where six are blue, the value of theta that maximizes our likelihood ends up being 0 0.6, and that kind of makes intuitive sense to us. That's that's not shocking. Okay. And then um, once you have your maximum likelihood estimate, then you can use that, that estimate for future calculations. So um, basically if somebody asks, all right, um, now that you've observed some data out of this box, right? So now that we've observed six blue marbles out of 10 marbles in this box, if I were to draw three more marbles with replacement, you know, one, one, two, three, and so on and so forth, what is the probability that I'm gonna get exactly two marbles out of three, right? What, um, so that answer is gonna be answered using um, the binomial probability, which will be, uh, or binomial distribution, which, and the answer is gonna be three, choose two. And we're gonna plug in our estimate that we got. We, our estimate is 0. 0.6. We do 0. 0.6 squared times one minus 0. 0.6 raised to the one. Um, and the answer that we get is 0 0.432, okay? All right, 
and uh, and that's that's basically how um, frequentist, uh, uh, you know, is the, the frequentist approach to this problem. So maybe I should just pause here for a moment and make sure everyone's okay with this. I, I went through it kind of quickly, but then again, this is also hopefully a review. So I don't know if you guys have any questions or anything like that. Let me also give you your first quiz answer for today. First quiz answer is B as in bear, um, like Bruin bear, B as in bear is your first quiz answer. This is the uh, letter B. Okay, um, and then um, in your kind of your introductory stats class, you probably also created confidence intervals, right? So uh, let's just pretend, uh, I didn't go through the calculations, but um, let's just pretend that we make a confidence interval for the proportion of blue marbles on the box, okay? So we, we make a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for the proportion of marbles that are blue. And let's say that margin of error turns out to be nine percentage points. And so our confidence interval goes from 0.51 to 0.69, right? Because our, our estimate is 0.6. We go plus or minus nine, nine percentage points. And so our confidence interval is 0.51 to 0.69. We say, I am 95% confident that the proportion of blue marbles is between 51% and 69%. And I think your, well, your statistics teacher should have told you that you are not allowed to say this, that you are not allowed to say there is a 95% probability that the proportion is between 51% and 69%. Uh, did, did your professors emphasize that as well when, when you were teaching, when you were learning this? Okay. I mean, at least I emphasize it. So, and the, and the reason for this is that in frequentist statistics, that proportion, the proportion that is blue in the proportion of blue marbles in the box is treated as a fixed value that has no variation, no uncertainty associated with it. And because there, it does not vary, it does not make sense to talk about probability, right? It only makes sense to talk about probability when, when there's uncertainty. So before I flip the coin, I can say, I'm gonna flip the coin. What is the probability that it lands heads and you would say it's 0.5, that, that's a question that makes sense. However, once I flip the coin and I ask, what is the probability that the coin has landed heads? What's the probability that the coin has landed heads? That is a nonsense question because the coin either landed heads or it didn't land heads, okay? It does not make sense to talk about the probability that the coin has landed heads. It either did or it didn't you don't know how the coin has landed. You don't know how the coin has landed. So you can say, I am 50% confident that it landed heads. But to talk about the probability that the coin has landed heads doesn't make sense because it either landed heads or it didn't land heads, okay? And similarly, when we talk about confidence intervals, the proportion of blue marbles in the, in the box is either in this interval of 0.51 and 0.69, but it's a fixed value. There's no uh, uncertainty associated with it. So it does not make sense, sense It does not make sense to say that there's a 95% probability, okay? We don't know what it is. So we can say things like I'm 95% confident that it's in the interval, but we can't say that there's a 95% probability that it's in the interval. Okay, Professor Christo emphasized this heavily. Very good, I would expect nothing less from Professor Christo. So. Um, okay, so um, so that's that's how we approach it in a, from a frequentist perspective, okay, is that we say, you know, that the proportion in the box is a fixed value. It's either going to be in this interval or it's not, okay? So we don't talk about probability. That's frequentist reasoning, okay? When you do Bayesian statistics, okay, that unknown parameter, the <laughs> sorry, this box is so loud, but the unknown um, a parameter of what proportion is blue is not treated as a fixed value, okay? It is treated as a random variable. And so now we can talk about probabilities, okay? So, so when we're, you know, 
treating this unknown parameter, you know, what's the proportion that's blue? Maybe it doesn't make sense if we're talking about drawing marbles out of a box, right? Because the, you know, you can say, you know what, just stop. Let's take the box, let's dump them out, let's count up the marbles, and we will get some proportion that's blue, okay? And, and it's not going to be subject to random variable. Like I can just open up the box and I can count how many are blue, and I'm going to know the added exact proportion, right? So that's, that's something that we could do. And um, so maybe it doesn't make sense to treat it as a random variable. But there's a lot of other situations where the unknown parameter is subject to a bunch of random forces, okay, or random changes. So for example, you might have the question, what proportion uh, in the United States are people under the age of 18, right? So basically, what proportion of people in the US are children, okay? And, and that exact proportion is subject to a bunch of random forces, right? Um, people are born, people die, people age every single day. Some, you know, yesterday this, uh, this person was under the age of 18 and today this person's over the age of 18, okay? And so, um, and, and these are all kind of uh, random changes that are happening every day. And so that exact proportion of, of how many people are under the age of 18 is, can be thought of as a random variable, okay? It's probably going to stay fairly steady, but it's going to, you know, shift up or a little bit up or a little bit down every single day, uh, depending on, you know, what changes have happened, okay? And so, so in that case, it might make sense to treat the proportion as a random variable, okay? And even if we talk about the box, if we just change a few things, and we treat probability as a subjective belief rather than the long run frequency, but rather as a subjective belief, then we can also treat the unknown value as a random, uh, random variable, right? So let's say, uh, you know, with this box, we are never allowed to look inside, okay? So, um, so we're never allowed to look inside. And therefore, when we talk about what's the probability of getting a blue marble out of the box, Okay, um, you know, we don't want to treat it as like, what are we going to get in the long run? What are, you know, what are we going to get if we basically open up the box and look inside, but we treat it as a subjective belief. Okay, we can treat that as a random variable, we can say, you know, I believe that when I draw a marble out of this box, that uh, it produces a blue marble with probability 60% or something like that. Okay, so we can treat the probability also as a as a subjective belief. And, and so this is often how you will see when, when you're talking about Bayesian statistics, you'll often see this idea of probability as a subjective belief. It's a little bit strange, but it's kind of just this idea that we're not gonna be allowed to settle on a single answer. Like in frequency statistics, we can open up the box, we can go off to infinity and try something uh, infinitely many times, but sometimes that's just not an option for us, okay? And so, um, so if we treat the parameter, such as the proportion that is blue in the box or some other parameter that's defining our, um, our distribution, the parameter, because it's a random variable, is going to have its own probability distribution. Parameters have their own probability distributions. And now our calculations are going to get a lot more complicated because the parameter is not treated as a single value but is now associated with the distribution. Okay, I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of this in a, a moment. But basically, um, you know, when you did the frequencies approach, you just looked at your data and you said, all right, my maximum likelihood estimate is this. And now I'm gonna use this, this estimate in kind of all of my future calculations. And, you know, it might just me, be me, but that feels a, a tiny bit uncomfortable, right? So for example, I don't know what proportion of marbles, what proportion is blue in the box. I've observed 10 marbles. And based on that, I'm gonna say, okay, um, six of my marbles are blue and therefore my estimate is 60%. And I'm just gonna use that in kind of all of my calculations. But um, it also seems a little bit strange that we're settling on this value that we're gonna just kind of say that the proportion is 0.6 based on only just 10 observations, right? So for example, you know, if you were doing some kind of 
like in a political, um, if you were doing political polling and you want to kind of do some calculations, if you surveyed just 10 people and you get, you know, 60% support this particular candidate, um, you can, uh, I think it would be, um, it, it would feel a little bit uncomfortable to say, all right, my estimate is 60%, so-and-so is gonna win, you know, just based on a, a sample of 10 people, okay? And, and so with the Bayesian approach, we're going to treat that proportion, the proportion of blue as a random variable, all right? And so when you create a distribution to reflect what the data that we've observed, we're, <coughs> we're gonna have a distribution with a peak at 0.6, to kind of acknowledge the data that we've seen, but we'll probably also have high probabilities for 0.55 and 0.65, uh, which acknowledges that the proportion could be, you know, other values as well. And, and we might draw a distribution that looks something like this. Okay, and, and this, is, this is a little bit arbitrary, but, but we can say, you know what, based on the data I've, I've seen, where um, six marbles are blue out of 10 marbles, total, we can say, you know, theta, the proportion that's blue has a peak at 0.6, but we're going to say, you know what, it could very well be 0.7. It could very well be 0.5 or 0.4. You know, the proportion could be something, you know, like 0.4. And just by random chance, I happen to get um, six out of 10 blue marbles or something like that. Okay. So we have a question. It says, is it fair to say that in the Bayesian method, we use the confidence interval in future calculations instead of a fixed value. So you're actually not using a confidence interval. And in, in fact, in Bayesian statistics, there's a confidence interval doesn't exist. You get a probability interval. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna use the entire distribution in future calculations. And, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a um, kind of, I guess in a, in a later slide and, and in future lectures, we'll, we'll definitely do the calculations, okay? But, but we're gonna basically take into account the entire distribution in the future when we do future calculations. But it's, it's the idea that we're not gonna just settle on 0.6, right? In frequency statistics, the maximum likelihood estimate is 0.6. And we say, let's just use 0.6 for all future calculations. Bayesian statistics says, we're gonna model it with a distribution. I wanna take the possibility that it's 0.6, but I also wanna consider the possibility that it's 0.7. 0.72, 0.8, 0.709. We're going to consider every single possibility. And that makes the calculations more complicated. Okay. So the trade off with the Bayesian approach, rather than just zeroing in on a single value, is that we now have to consider all of the possible values. And that makes the calculations a lot more complicated. So again, with frequentist statistics, if the question is, I'm going to draw three more marbles, what's the probability that I get two marbles that are blue? You just plug in 0.6 into your binomial calculation. And it's very straightforward. It's very easy. For the Bayesian answer, and we're not going to get to it today, it, it's not that hard, but it involves integrals and it can become a pain, is that we have to consider all the values of theta, um, all, all the values that theta could possibly be. So we're going to say theta could be 0.6, theta could be 0.5, theta could be 0.4, it could be 0.3, it could be 0.2. It could even be 0.1, maybe even 0 0.11, 0 0.01. It's very unlikely that theta is 0 0.01, but it's technically not impossible. So we're going to consider that as well. Okay. And what we do is we're going to weight theta being 0 0.6 to be heavy because there's a high probability that theta is 0.6. And we're going to say the probability that theta is 0 0.01 is quite low. And so we're going to give it a low weight but it's still gonna get factored into our calculations. So we have to do kind of this, this integral later on, but, um, but we won't do that today. All right, is that all right? Just kind of this notion that our, um, that our random variable, that our parameter is a random variable. And it's not, we're not gonna just settle on a single value, but we're gonna take into, consideration all the kind of possible values that theta could be. Let me go ahead and give you your second quiz answer, which is C for cat. C as in cat is your second quiz answer for the day. 
C as in cat, second quiz answer. So we're going to create, um, so I'm going to introduce the beta binomial. All right. Um, uh, let me introduce the beta binomial model, which is um, uh, an important, important uh, kind of model that we use in Bayesian statistics. And it starts off with kind of a beta distribution, and, and we use it for kind of data that comes from a binomial model. And um, and so I'm going to introduce this. We're not going to complete the beta binomial model just yet. And uh, we're going to spend most of the time talking about the beta distribution here. OK. So did you guys talk about the beta distribution 100B a little bit? And, uh, and what do you guys remember of the beta distribution? There's some sort of PDF. <laughs> What's that? There's like some sort of wacky PDF. Some sort of wacky PDF. And we wrote uh, gamma, but worst. Oh, OK. No, it's the beta distribution is a beautiful distribution, OK? Um, All right, let's, um, I'm going to do uh, an example from baseball, okay, and then and we'll um, uh, use this to kind of introduce us to the beta distribution. All right, so, um, and, and I have to give credit, um, because uh, this is largely based off of this example that comes from this website, uh, Variance Explained, and, uh, and I've, I've basically used some of this in a uh, for part of your homework assignment, okay? So uh, in baseball, one of the statistics that's tracked is a player's batting average, okay? And batting average is calculated by doing hits divided by at-bats. And, uh, and forgive me for mansplaining this, but you know, if you're not familiar with baseball, um, <laughs> you know, basically the players try to hit the ball with a bat and, and if they, a hit only counts if they, you know, if they hit the ball and then they're able to run to base. Okay, so if they if they hit the ball and it and it ends in an out or something else, um, it's not counted as a hit. So they have to be able to, you know, they hit the ball and they have to run to base and they have to, you know, make it safely to base um, in order to count as a hit. Uh, an at bat is basically um, every opportunity that the player has. Um, to, uh, to get on base. Um, you, it's a little bit more complicated. You subtract out the base on balls and a few other things. Um, but basically, the, uh, the batting average is going to be hits divided by at bats. Okay. And in uh, Major League Baseball, which is kind of the um, number one organization for, uh, for playing baseball, is that pretty much almost all of the players are expected to have a batting average a, a, over. 0.2, okay, or in, in, in baseball, we call this, um, you have to bat above 200, okay? And, uh, and basically, if, if a player's batting average is below 200, then, uh, or 0.2, they're likely to get cut from the team, okay? They're, they're likely to get, um, you know, sent down to the minors or something like that, okay? So um, a, a player, a, a team is not likely to keep somebody who has a batting average below um, 0.2. Okay, or 200. Okay, and on the other hand, if a batting average is above 300, they are considered to be very excellent. Okay, so batting averages fall in kind of this very narrow range from 0.2 to kind of 0.3. The highest career batting average of all time, okay, like in the entire history of baseball being played and stats being tracked, the highest career batting average of all time is 0.3. 366 or 366. Okay, and that was uh, Ty Cobb, and uh, and so it's it's almost um, and in recent memory, like nobody <laughs> has had like a season batting average over 400 or anything like that. If somebody has a batting average over 330, that's considered to be like excellent, excellent, um, you know, phenomenally good. Okay, but pretty much almost everyone's going to have a batting average between 200 and 300. Not everyone, but um, and and some people, you know, a few people have batting averages over three hundred. So the, the batting averages fall on this narrow range, okay. And so you know, let's say a team hires a new player, okay, 
And we don't know because it's a new player. We don't know what this player's batting average is going to be. Okay. And so his, let's say in his first 10 at bats, the player gets five hits. Okay. And so, so far this player's batting average is 500, five divided by 10.5. This player has a batting average of 500. Okay. And so according to frequentist statistics, our estimate of the player's batting average is 500 or 0.5. Okay. But any season, any, any person who's paid attention to baseball, just our intuition says that there's no way that this player can sustain a batting average of 500 or 0.5 throughout the rest of the season. Okay. That if, as the player continues to play baseball, that we expect that batting average not to stay at 0.5, but to drop down to something lower. Okay. Um, just because, <laughs> you know, if the player is able to maintain a batting average of 500 throughout the rest of the season, that's going to make this player like one of the greatest players of all time. Right. And, and that's unlikely to be the case. Okay. And so, um, so how can we express this mathematically rather than just say, Oh, it's, there's no way it's got to, it's going to be 500. Okay. There's no way that the batting average is 0.5, but it's got to be something lower. It's, it's most likely between 0.2 and 0.3 or something like that. How can we incorporate this mathematically rather than just kind of going off of gut feeling and saying, uh, I'm going to guess some number 0.29 or 0.28 or something like that. How, how can we express this? Okay. So, so one thing we can use is the beta distribution. Okay. So, um, so we might be able to incorporate this prior knowledge into something we call the prior distribution. Okay. And so the idea that almost all players will have a batting average over 200 <clears throat> and no one should have a batting average over 400 or 0.4 can be expressed with kind of a picture that looks like this. Okay. So here I, I created a distribution where pretty much the, if theta is the overall batting average, pretty much all the values are above 0.2 uh, and you know, you have, uh, a little bit above 0.3 and basically nothing over 0.4. Okay. And so this is just kind of a picture representing what um, uh, the kind of the distribution of batting averages um, that we might have. So this, this represents a little bit of our uh, kind of prior baseball knowledge. Is that all right? This, this picture here kind of incorporating what, what I've said about baseball here. All right, and so the beta distribution, which maybe you only have some, you don't have great memories of yet so far, but maybe you'll love it after this. I don't know. Um, it, it's a continuous distribution and it's defined only on the interval zero to one, okay? And because it's defined from zero to one, it's frequently used to model a random proportion, right? because proportions are always between zero and one, probabilities are always between zero and one. And so the beta distribution is often used to model a random proportion or a random probability, all right? The PDF looks like this, all right? And then some of you said, oh, it's got this scary or wacky PDF. And, and that, it looks scary and wacky because of this term here. This, um, you have this beta function, okay? And the beta function is made up of the gamma functions, right? You have gamma alpha times gamma beta divided by gamma alpha plus beta. And what is the gamma function anyway? Um, you know, the gamma function is actually uh, a continuous approximation of the factorial function. Um, just, um, I don't know, it, it, that's not even important, okay? But <laughs> also don't be scared of the gamma function. If everybody understands the factorial function, right? Factorial of three is three times two times one. Factorial of four is four times three times two times one and something like that. What if, um, what if you drew a kind of a smooth continuous line connecting those points? That's basically the gamma function, okay? The gamma function looks crazy on the negative side because if you do negative three factorial, it's gonna end up negative. But if you do negative four factorial, it ends up positive because you have an even number of negative numbers being multiplied. So on the negative side, the gamma function looks absolutely crazy bonkers. Um, but on the positive side, it's basically the factorial function, but 
connected with a smooth line. But anyway, that that's not even important, okay? Because um, if you look only at this side, it's not, I don't think it's that scary. It's theta raised to some power and it's one minus theta raised to another power. That's basically all it is. This thing over here, which looks scary, this is just a weird constant, okay? And the only function that this weird constant serves is so that it qualifies as a PDF because the PDFs have a rule that everything has to integrate to one, right? If you take the area under the curve of a PDF, it has to have an area of one. And, and it, it ends up looking scary because, you know, we have to, whatever number you plug in here for alpha, whether alpha is one or 500, the whole thing has to integrate to one. So you have this scary looking constant, but its only purpose is so that the PDF integrates to one. Okay, so it looks scary. Admittedly, this thing looks scary, but the, the heart of the distribution is really just theta raised to a power and one minus theta raised to another power, okay? Which I think is a lot less scary. And, and a little bit of intuition about um, these parameters, you've got alpha and you've got beta, is that you can think of these as kind of uh, how many yes and how many no values you have seen so far. Okay, so um, so alpha plus beta will be kind of like the total number of observations you've seen so far. And then alpha divided by alpha plus beta is kind of like the proportion of yeses that you've seen so far, okay? So the beta distribution will kind of reflect the probability of getting a yes. You'll have a peak around alpha divided by alpha plus beta, which is kind of like your relative proportion you've seen so far. And if alpha plus beta has a large sum, you're going to have less spread. And if alpha plus beta has a low sum, you're going to have more spread because it indicates you've either seen a lot of observations, so you're very confident about the value of alpha, the, the proportion, or you've only seen a few observations. So, so anyway, I'll just show you a bunch of slides and hopefully this, this will make a little bit of sense, okay? So when alpha and beta are both equal to one, you get the uniform distribution. Um, values between zero, and one are all equally likely, okay? So it's kind of just like saying inside the box, you know there's at least one blue marble and you know there's at least one marble that's not blue. What's the proportion of blue marbles in the box? Okay, well, you have no idea. You have basically hardly any information about the box. So any, any proportion between zero and one seems equally valid here, okay? Um, here we've drawn, we've got alpha equal to two and beta equal to two. That'd be equivalent to saying like, I've drawn four marbles out of the box, two are red and two are blue, something like that. I mean, I'm sorry, two are blue and two are not blue, you know, and, and based on that 0.5 is the most likely value, but then, you know, any value, um, other values are also quite likely. And so, um, so you kind of have this distribution. Um, as we draw more marbles out of the box here, I've got alpha five and beta equal to five, you know, it starts to, um, the distribution gets a little bit narrower. Like if I've observed 10 marbles and we get five red and five blue, you know, the proportion that's, I'm sorry, five blue and five not blue, I keep saying red and blue, but five blue and five not blue, the proportion of blue is gonna be close to 0.5, um, but not as spread out as if we've only seen uh, a total of four, four marbles. Okay, and as I bump it up here, I've observed 40 marbles, 20 are blue, 20 are not. And, you know, the right now, because I've seen an equal number of blue and not blue, the, the proportion that's most likely is 0.5, but it's skinnier because I've observed more. And so because I've observed 40 marbles, I'm quite confident that it's not going to be 90% blue. I'm quite confident that it's not going to be 20% blue either. And here it is with alpha 50 and beta equal to 50. So that's observing 100 marbles where 50 are blue and 50 are not blue. So I'm pretty confident that it's around 0.5 blue. You know, it could be as low as 40% blue, as high as 60% blue, but I'm pretty sure that it's not gonna be 30% blue or 20% blue because if it's 30% blue, it seems really unlikely that I would get 50 blue marbles out of 100, okay? So, so as I, as alpha plus beta get larger, the distribution gets skinnier because I'm more and more confident that it's not any of these other values, okay? 
Um, and in all of these cases, because I've seen alpha and beta equal to the same number, alpha is two, beta two, alpha is five, beta is five, alpha 20, beta is 20. Because all of these numbers have been equal, everything's centered around 0.5. If I shift the thing, so I have alpha equal to one and beta equal to 99, this means I've, sorry, I've drawn a hundred marbles out of the box. Only one of them have been blue. All the 99 other ones have been some other color, okay? And so in that case, what's the proportion that is blue? You know, it's gonna be pretty close to zero, okay? Te I, technically, uh, this is a little bit, uh, the pseudo count, yeah, it's, it's a little bit weirder. But, but basically, um, you know, the proportion that's blue is, you know, centered around something very low here, okay? Uh, here, alpha is two and beta is 98. And so you get this distribution that, that's quite, um, also quite heavily skewed, centered around something close to, you know, 0.02 and things like that. And as I increase alpha and decrease beta, the proportion that is blue, so right now alpha and beta are adding up to 100. So it's kind of like saying I've observed 100 marbles total. Um, we get a distribution, you know, that's centered around 0.5. And here's alpha 10 beta equal to 90. Now it's centered at around 0.1. Here's alpha 20 beta equal to 80. Um, and centered around 0.2. Okay. And so as I as I change the parameters of the beta distribution, we basically get um, the the proportion to kind of shift where it's centered. Okay. So again, with alpha equal to 50 and beta equal to 50, it's centered at 0.5. And here is alpha equal to 70 and beta equal to 30, okay? Um, so we have a question. How is this different from looking at a confidence interval in frequency statistics? Okay, I haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, we will we'll discuss something like this in a future lecture, okay? So um, we'll create something called a probability interval uh, in, in a future lecture. Okay, let me just show you a little bit more about beta distributions. So here we've got alpha equal to 70 and beta equal to 30. So basically, um, if I do um, alpha divided by alpha plus beta, we're going to get 0.7. But I also just want to show you what happens if I decrease that sum of alpha plus beta to something smaller, right? So right now, alpha plus beta add up to 100. Here, they add up to 90, but alpha still has a proportion of 0.7. And so what happens is, we're still centered at 0.7, but if I'm decreasing the sum of alpha and beta from 100 down to 90, the interval gets a little bit wider or the, uh, the distribution gets wider. Here, they add up to 80 and we can see it gets wider still. They add up to uh, 70 here and it gets wider still. So here it is, they add up to 100 and they just kind of, it keeps getting wider as I decrease the sum of alpha and beta. Okay, so here, if alpha and beta add up to 30, where alpha is still 21 out of 30 is still 0.7, they, all of these distributions remain kind of centered or have a peak at 0.7, but they go from being quite narrow to quite wide, okay, until you get something like this, right? So this kind of represents, you know, you've only observed 10 observations where 70% of them are blue, you know, what's, what's the probability of being blue? You've got this wide inner, wide distribution here you've got, you know, something a little bit more narrow, okay? And if we go in the opposite direction, where I increase the sum of alpha and beta, okay, it gets more and more narrow, right? So here I've got alpha 700 and beta equal to 300. I've got this very skinny distribution, still centered at 0.7, but it's now very skinny, okay? And, um, and you'll notice that the density axis gets really, really, really tall, and that's because the, um, the integral of the PDF has to sum up to one, right? So the integral of the PDF has to sum to one. And so you get this really tall distribution so that the area under the curve is equal to one. And you know the area under this curve is also equal to one. The area under this curve is also equal to one. And you can see that the density has to kind of accommodate the, basically the different widths here. Is, is this feeling okay regarding what the beta distribution is? Okay, you know, um, so hopefully, you know, I don't know if you had bad experiences with the beta distribution in the past, but it's, 
I, I understand that the PDF looks scary, but it's it's not that scary. Okay, you can kind of think of it as how many yeses and how many noes have I seen so far, and kind of what's the the proportion or probability of getting a yes so far is okay. And so, going back to our uh, baseball example, if I want to create a distribution that kind of represents my prior knowledge, I might choose a beta distribution with shape parameters 81 and 219. Now, when I do that, I'm going to get a distribution that looks like this, where most of my values are over, pretty much all of my values are over 0.2, and almost all of my values are, you know, basically less than 0.35. Okay. And certainly everything's below, almost everything's below 0.4, and, you know, most of our values are under 0.3. Now, these numbers, 81 and 219, they're a little bit arbitrarily selected, okay? There's nothing, you know, they just kind of have the nice property that if I add these two together, they add up to 300. But, you know, if somebody wanted to pick, say, 75 and 200, that would probably also fit the criteria. Um, or if somebody picks, you know, 70 and two, 210, that probably also fits the criteria in terms of you know, if, if we just kind of specify this so that almost all the values are over 200 and most are below 300 or things like that, you know, there's probably a wide selection of what alpha and beta shape parameters we can select that will still kind of fit this description. So these numbers themselves are a little bit arbitrary, but the resulting distribution does align with our prior knowledge of, of what we said about batting averages, where almost everybody should be around above 200, no one should be above 400, and, you know, most of the values should be between that kind of 200 and 300 range, or 0.2 and 0.3 uh, range, and so, um, um, so th this fits the bill, and I've chosen these because that is what um, the author of that Variance Explained website uh, has, has chosen as well, but um, but if you wanted to choose slightly different numbers, um, that's also allowed. And so, you know, one complaint against Bayesian methods is that the selection of the prior distribution feels arbitrary. And there is truth to that. There's truth to that um, objection in that, you know, people could talk about what prior distribution should be used for batting averages. And it will probably look something like this but not necessarily exactly the same. And, and if you switch up your prior distributions, you might get slightly different results in the end. And, um, but that's also okay, all right? Um, everybody starts off with different prior knowledge and prior experience. And so when new data comes in, everybody has slightly different takeaways from it as well. Okay, anyway, um, this is a little bit of a kind of a, an introduction to uh, some Bayesian concepts and, uh, and specifically the beta distribution. And I, I want you guys to get uh, familiar with the beta distribution. It will be important. And, um, and we'll end here for today. Oh, let me give you your last quiz answer. Last quiz answer for today is D as in dog. Okay, D as in dog for the third quiz answer. Okay, uh, we'll end here for today. Last quiz answer, D as in dog. And we will see you guys on Wednesday. And, uh, and we'll see you then.